Welcome to Advanced Retrodaptics. I'm Tyler Disney, and today I want to talk about polymathic skill acquisition. So broad skills is one of the things that distinguishes post-consumer praxis from merely frugal consumerism, right? A mature post-consumer lifestyle decentralizes money and introduces competency skills in, in a variety of fields to the toolkit. It's not that post-consumers don't solve any problems with money. It's that money isn't the only tool they use to solve problems. So, right, of course, it's possible to be remarkably free by living on very little money simply by being extremely frugal, right? Shopping at discount stores, clipping coupons, stocking garage sales, buying used, and the like. And there's nothing wrong with those activities in and of themselves, but if that's your only, if, but if those are your only problem-solving methods, it's it's not a very sexy way to live, right? And it's still very focused on money. It's still stuck in the paradigm that all problems are solved with money. You're just trying to figure out how to solve your problems with less money than you know is generally accepted. Post-consumerism is is a bit beyond that. It's it's introducing other ways of solving problems than just money. Right. The point of what I'm trying to do with my life isn't to spend very little money. That's not the point. That's that's a means to an end, right? The point is to reject the paradigm of consumerism and invent, adopt a, a less dysfunctional paradigm and free myself in a profound way in the process. So diverse and appropriate skills are the backbone of post-consumer praxis. The other primary mechanisms, you know, frugality, wise resource management, systems thinking, you can kind of consider those just further skills, right? Just further areas of competency. So from that, that view, you know, skills are everything <laughs> or they encompass everything. In this episode, I want to do a deeper dive on skill acquisition for the aspiring polymathic post-consumer of which I consider myself still very much an aspiring post-consumer, right? I've done some previous episodes on this, notably episode number three, The Skill Ratchet, and episode seven, The Hypercompetence Loop. Those are worth listening to or refreshing uh, refreshing yourself on uh, if it's been a while. Anyway, so a as my path on this journey progressed and I got freer and freer, I found myself faced with the dilemma of which skills to pursue, which areas of competency ought I invest time and energy in. How should I think about and approach skill acquisition? So this this poses my attempt to round up how I think about skill acquisition to date. <clears throat> so first, we got to recognize Jacob Lund Fisker's seven categories of the Renaissance person. He wrote about this in his book. And I believe he would now inter include an eighth category. The categories are intellectual, physiological, economic, ecological, social, emotional, technical, and the eighth category, not in the book, uh, but I, that I think he would include now is spiritual. A balanced post-consumer ought to exhibit basic competency, competencies in all of these areas, and you should read the book to um, read about how uh, he defines uh, each of those categories. It's difficult to imagine a solid polymathic lifestyle if you're extremely deficient in one or more of these categories, right? So another way to think about skills is uh, is how to evaluate the skill level. One way to evaluate the skill level is the pay-to-play, break-even, or make-money metric. Uh, one lens on skill level from Jacob's book is to ask whether it, whether it costs you money to do the thing, uh, whether you break even or whether you're good enough at it that people would pay you to do it for them. Now, this metric doesn't necessarily apply to all activities and all skills, but it does it definitely does point in the direction of economic resiliency. You know, if there's only one thing you're good enough at to get paid for, you know, most people have a job, a specialty, something like that, then you only have one skill that will bring an income, right? Well, what if your skill is stenography, but you break your fingers? <laughs> what if your skill is something AI is going to take over next week? What if your job is something that requires physical ability and you come down with some illness or uh, other 
you know, you break your leg or something like that. Having one remunerable skill, it's, it's fragile. So just because you could get paid for a skill that you have, you know, it doesn't mean you have to. You know, you might be a good enough cook, a good enough bicycle mechanic, good enough, I don't know, tax preparer to generate income from that activity if you wanted to, uh, but, but not necessarily have any reason to seek remuneration for it at the moment. It's fine. It's a lot more robust place to be in than that of the specialist. I want to mention that Jacob also has what he calls the 6C model of competency. It's really worth checking out. I recommend you check out his book for that. Also, it's been discussed in a number of ways in the uh, on the forum. Um, I'm not going to dive into that. That's uh, That's a whole thing. It's great. I think about it a lot. It's a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to talk about in this episode. Just wanted to make sure that you're aware of it. If you're not aware of it, you should definitely check it out. Um, so the other framework to think about is the three category model. This is something that I kind of came up with in discussion with other people on the forum. So the way I look at skills is via the three activity categories of fundamentals, stoke, and vocation. So fundamental skills are you know, basic life, basic adulting life skills that just about everybody has to do. Everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to clean themselves. Everybody's got to get dressed. Everybody has needs for shelter, transportation, talking to other beings, you know, basic social skills, um, how they take in information and how they process it. You know, do you read? Do you get all your news from Facebook? That sort of thing. Um so basic stuff that pretty much everyone has to do, right? Then there's vocational activities and uh, vocational life's work. For most people, that's going to be related to job, career, uh, stuff you get paid for, but not necessarily. Um, that's why that's why I use the word vocational and, and vocational life's work means the same thing to me uh, or in this context. So you don't have to be paid for something that might be in this for something to be in this category. You know, particularly if you're financially independent, you don't care about income. But it, 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 this is categories where activities go that you consider important and are part of your purpose, your purpose for being in the world. And then there's stoke activities, and that's just whatever you're intrinsically motivated to do. I use stoke and intrinsically intrinsic motivation synonymously. This could be anything, right? Climbing. I don't know, kayaking, painting, hiking, reading, socializing, playing Dungeons and Dragons, building really elegant spreadsheets, skydiving, you know, whatever. Um, these, are th these are things you do for the sake of doing the thing itself, not for any external reward. And, you know, any, any given activity or skill, it could be in uh, two or all three categories. So, for example, maybe you love, a.k.a. are stoked, to cook, which is a fundamental activity. Everyone's got to eat. And you start a pop-up restaurant or a catering business or you become a chef or something like that, right? Which would fall under the vocation or life's work category. So the boundaries between the categories are blurry. And I spend very little time fussing about where any activity or skill belongs. Okay, so you okay, so those are some frameworks. The question is like where to start? What skills are worth pursuing first? Um, and it, it can all be very overwhelming, right? It, another trap is that it, it's tempting to jump into developing sexy skills, fancy stuff, while leaving boring fundamental skills half learnt, or to jump between interests and not really getting anywhere with anything. It is best to be strategic about skill acquisition, um, definitely at the beginning of a post-consumer journey. Um, so, you know, for me, I try to start at the, be at the beginning and, and I try to start with my weaknesses. Um, and, and I, and I looked at my, my primary lens for viewing where the beginning was and what my weaknesses were, was what I spent the most money on because I wanted the most freedom as quickly as possible and having a high burn rate represented low freedom, right? So I want to get my burn rate down so I could get my freedom up. So, you know, for example, I, I could choose to learn sewing first, but who cares if I save myself $300 per year on clothes? Because I just don't spend that much money on clothes because, um, you know, who, who cares if I, if I can save myself $300 a year by learning how to sew if I don't know how to feed myself for less than $750 a month, 
right? Like that just makes no sense. I should focus on food first. So the first imperative, you know, the where to start is to increase your freedom as quickly and as durably as possible by focusing on skills that will decrease your expenses, your cost of living. So decreasing my burn rate would increase my runway, which would give me more time in the future to develop skills that can reduce my cost of living further or might have no monetary payoff. I just want to do them because I'm stoked on it, right? I, I describe this idea in more depth in the skill ratchet. Um, so so I figured out how much I spent on stuff by by building a spreadsheet, analyzing my expense data, making a number of forecasts, and then playing with the numbers to see what I could make work and see where I should focus on first. And, you know, this makes me wonder if the first and most important fundamental skill isn't how to build a spreadsheet. I kind of lucked out. I already had this skill uh, from a decade and a half of engineering. Um, so it was easy and natural for me to kind of build a, a personal finance spreadsheet. Um, I know spreadsheets are boring and I know a lot of people don't like the idea even of getting into spreadsheeting, but they're kind of, they're, they're tools of freedom. <laughs> like I'm sure there are some people out there, there's some personalities who are capable of attaining freedom and a sexy post-consumer lifestyle without any kind of financial tracking. But I, I don't, I don't understand how that's doable. Right. So Good on you if you got that kind of magic, but for the rest of us, skipping the skill of spreadsheeting, I think is extremely bold and not in a fun, you know, sexy pirate sort of bold way, more like a, I'll try anything once, how bad can meth be sort of bold, right? Um, not, probably not a good idea. If, if you're thinking about skipping that step, do a, do a really solid gut check to make sure that you don't need to. Otherwise, I I just think you you should do it. So at any rate, I think a a sequence for learning uh, skills uh, for approaching this looks something like step one: start with fundamental skills to get your burn rate as low as possible as quickly as possible. Use a spreadsheet, identify the easy wins, and go after those first. Then go after skills that will make your life better. So particularly if you crowbarred, say, your food budget down to $100 a month, but you're tired of eating beans and rice with DIY hot sauce three meals a day, then spend time becoming a better cook, you know? So you'll, you, you'll get your quality of life back up, but keep your cost of life low. So, so after you spend some time to get your your freedom up by focusing on fundamental skills to get your cost of living low um then you know i'm not sure if it matters if you look to vocation or stoke next it, it either depends on your circumstances you know where you're at in life or maybe it doesn't matter or you know maybe you should do both at the same time um this is part of what i mean about not fussing about the, the boundaries between the categories like this whole process is actually iterative, right? It's not linear. Um, and so it's far more important to start anywhere and just go, uh, than to start at the perfect place. Cause there probably is no perfect place to start, right? Just, just start. So if you have and need a job, but it's stressful or you want to succeed harder at it, you want to change jobs, you want to, you know, um, l l uh, make an, a, a lateral move, maybe like learn another skill and do that have any other goals. So then like, okay, spend time in vocational category next so that the time you spend working, if that's what you're doing or pursuing your purpose is spent as productively and as positively and as fulfillingly as possible. So, you know, read Cal Newport, read Scott Young, build a solid GTD system, learn attention control and digital minimalism, do what you got to do to identify the important vocational skills that are relevant for you to work on based on whatever your goals are. And look, there's an enormous amount of free, free resources and not expensive resources out there. Uh, I mean, books, YouTube videos, depending on your learning style, that will help you level up whatever vocational skills you identify as needful. And if you're not sure where to, f where or how to find those resources, 
You should put learn Google Foo at the top of your list. Uh, and then, you know, the Stoke category, I don't know, this one's kind of, well, I say it's simple, but I've got like a whole series of podcasts planned talking about Stoke, right? But basically, <laughs> theoretically, Stoke is simple. The Stoke category, these are just skills that are activities that you just want to do because you want to do them. Um, and arguably the point of post-consumer praxis is to maximize the amount of time you have available to spend under conditions of stoke. And the easiest way to do this is to combine activities, right? So find activities, find skills to develop that fall under stoke and fundamentals and or vocation, right? You, you know, like I said, like I gave earlier, the uh, the example of if you are stoked to cook, that's also a fundamental skill. And then if you need income and if you want to make that part of your life's work, your vocation, like do that. And and that's great. You also, I mean, of course, you got to be careful uh, to put too much um, uh, too much pressure on something you're stoked to do and, and add external rewards to it. I talk about that in previous episodes and also I'm going to talk about that more soon. Um, I guess Stoke is kind of complicated. <laughs> we'll talk more at any rate, as your freedom increases due to building your FU stash, wise resource management practices in a frugal lifestyle. And as you ease back from the, stress ball burnout brinkmanship of normal life you can take a harder look at jacob's eight categories of the renaissance ideal look for natural strengths to encourage and look for limiting weaknesses to bolster remember again this isn't some linear process you're going through it's cyclical and then at, you know at some point you might find it useful to consider how many of your skills are potentially remunerable it's one thing to have a big pile of cash lying around somewhere Another thing to know that you can generate income in any of, you know, half a dozen different ways, right? Having a big tank of money is nice. But if you have three to seven spigots all feeding from different springs, that's a whole nother level of robustness. Big tanks can burst or be siphoned off by thieves in the middle of the night. Three springs can dry up, but who cares? You've got access to four more, and you've got time to look for even more to, to increase your level of uh, resiliency. So, you know, th there's a part of this where you just kind of need to let I your identity and your purpose be your guide, right? Everyone is unique. Everyone has a different destiny to fulfill. That's why there's no prescriptive path for skill acquisition, some things that I want to, things that make sense for me to spend thousands of hours on makes no sense for another person to spend, you know, more than a handful of hours on or any. Getting a clear sense of, of what you want, your identity, your dharma, your purpose, th that'll help guide you through selection of skills to pursue. Which, of course, begs the question how you discover what that identity is. And I'm not sure I'm going to be great at, at helping you with that. I'm still trying to figure out what my identity is. But, you know, one way is to just try a bunch of different stuff and see what sticks. <laughs> Back to the iterative theme, right? Like, I, I think it is rare to know or decide what your purpose is and then get after the skills necessary to achieve it. Like, it's that simple. Um it's more like as you clarify your purpose over the months and years, or as you come up with hypotheses to test what your purpose is, you know, you let that guide your skill selection process. So for example, my, my ever evolving statement of purpose at the moment, it's something like my purpose is to become a polymathic pioneer species focused on iterating a new extra paradigmatic tech stack and cultural rule set appropriate to the long descent and the deindustrial revolution. Um, this is one reason why I'm terrible at answering the so what do you do question. <laughs> uh, but look, the point is, is that, that like, the statement isn't for other people. It's for you. It's what makes sense for you. And I just happen to not care what people think enough to like put it on the internet. So anyways, that's mine. And that, that helps me guide decisions about what skills to pursue. So for example, you know, some skills, so I have some skills, right? I have a set of skills, some skills that I'm 
that I have currently identified as skills that I want to pursue soon. So these are kind of like next skills for me that I'm that I'm taking active steps to uh, to acquire is uh, figuring out how to get salvage building materials. I know how to build stuff. I know how to fix stuff. I want to build more stuff, but I don't want to keep making trips to Home Depot to get the stuff for a variety of reasons, right? Like I'm into salvage materials, but I'm not skilled. I'm not good. I'm not experienced at getting those salvage materials. So that's one skill. Uh, like that's, that skill touches on technical, social, and also vocational. Um, as I see building stuff as a component of my life's work. I'm not sure it's really stoked based. It's not like a st- kind of stoked thing. I mean, I'm yeah. Anyways, um, vegetable guarding is another skill. You know, I'm a good enough cook. And I eat for less than $200 a month, but since I live so far from town, I don't have or want a car getting good, fresh vegetables is the weakest part of my food system. And, um, and I, and I spend a significant amount of my food, uh, budget on fresh vegetables. Um, so a bountiful garden up here would be just the thing. Another skill. I want to learn uh, passive solar greenhouse design and construction, like, like the new alchemists arc arcs that they built, except obviously modified for the climate I'm in. So this skill incorporates the previous two, you know, salvage and veggie gardening and involves a bunch of other skills, earth sheltered building, science analysis, modeling, climate modeling, learning about plants, etc. Right. Um, the skill, it's technical, it's ecological, it's vocational, it's stoke, and it's fundamental. I, this takes so many boxes, so I'm pretty excited to get going on it. Uh, I want to learn the skill of event hosting, both at the scale of, you know, just dinner parties, inviting people over, um, also, but also up to the scale of inviting larger groups of people to have a kind of interesting, uh, transformative experience. Um, that that's that's gonna that's a big lift for me it's pr- primarily a social skill um and I'm, I'm sure a lot of others are involved in that but that's something um i'm interested in developing a nature-based spirituality practice i'm lo- a practice i'm looking into uh druidry and also bill plotkin's work um i want to work on creative uh creative writing skills craft um this is this is stoke and vocational. Um, I want to learn motorcycle repair and customization. This is pure stoke. This doesn't actually really fit into my purpose at all. <laughs> Motorcycles are just really fun. Uh, and then there's like aesthetic design. I'm, I'm not even sure what the right words are to describe this skill. I mean, like I want to make my builds. Like I know how to build stuff. I don't know how to make it beautiful yet. I've never tried. Um, my, my stuff is functional. It's not beautiful. I want to change that. I want it functional and beautiful. This is stoke, vocational, fundamental, and technical. So, and this, I just want to say this fits my purpose because I'm keen to make, right? Like the lifeboat flotilla attractive, both structurally and aesthetically, not only because I like beautiful things as much as the next guy, but because I don't want to turn off people who would otherwise be down for getting involved with the flotilla. So that's that's just kind of a, a, a for example, a brief smattering of skills that I'm looking at developing next. Obviously, I've got a bunch of skills um, already. I'm, I have a fairly balanced skill set, um, but there's I'm not you know like any anyone I'm I'm Swiss cheese, so I've got I've got a ways to go uh, in my skill acquisition. Well, yeah, I've got the rest of my life. It's it's an infinite game kind of thing. So I. These these are some frameworks. These are some approaches to think about skill acquisition for for the polymath. Uh, something I've been kind of beating around the bush uh, a bit or teasing is is systems thinking approach because I think systems thinking approach is the intellectual toolkit, intellectual approach that really glues all of this together. So, uh, but this is the, I think this episode is long enough, so I'm going to save uh, the discussion of systems thinking for f- future episodes. I just wanted to point out that, um, I think this discussion of skills and ways to think of it is uh, kind of a first step to wrap your head around thinking about skills and activities and thinking about it in this way will help us talk about and think about systems thinking and as we talk about systems thinking we'll be able to 
think even more clearly about skill acquisition and you know what do we do on a day to day basis so it's all it's all tied together um and uh it's it's all yeah the systems thinking is highly relevant to the decision making process around skill acquisition so just just keep that in mind um but i hope this was useful uh, i hope these frameworks give you something to think about when it comes to skill acquisition uh there i mean this is a huge topic right so we've just scratched the surface and i feel like i've just i've just begun the sort of uh, s curve of uh competency at thinking about skill development holistically in my life but I hope that was helpful. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions specific to this episode, I'd love to hear them. Hit me up on the website, tylerjdisney.com. You can find on the about page, you can find um, where to plug, uh, send me an email if you want to do that. That'd be great. All right. 